organizers for inviting me. Uh, actually, I uh, was on sabbatical in Italy in 2005-2006 at Pisa. Uh, Steve Shore, who was the uh, chair of the astrophysics department, invited me. And I knew him from Washington, D.C. I am a uh, geochemist, a biogeochemist. So uh, my talk will be uh, really from that perspective. Um, so, uh, the title is The Biospheric Evolution is Costly uh, Deterministic. So, I would not uh, argue that this audience would be inevitable if uh, the Earth started the same way, but uh, roughly deterministic. Now, how do I advance? I use a Mac, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, which one? Uh, this one? Oh, that guy. Well, this is really uh, an old debate which uh, really uh, uh, brought an audience from uh, the, ma the journal uh, Natural History magazine. And of course, it sort of uh, was triggered by Stephen Jay Gould's book, wonderful life. So Simon Conway Morris uh, challenged uh, the paleo paleontological interpretation of these early Cambrian fossils. Uh, and in the debate in Natural History magazine, uh, Gould held that origin of life was very likely, but if you played the tape again of evolution, uh, you would ha not have, a really, you could have very different results. On the other hand, Simon Cameron and Morris um, argued the opposite, that uh, the origin of life was very unlikely, but that if you played the tape again, you would get pretty much the same pattern of evolution. And now there's a, a considerable literature, which I put in the slide, uh, by the way, if anyone wants a PDF of this, just email me. <laughs> and you, I'm not going to uh, read everything from this presentation. Uh, my point of view is that uh, both the origin of life and uh, the pattern of general evolution would be uh, likely. So these are two of Simon Conway Morris's books. Um, and so, as a biogeochemist, I've come to the conclusion that the strong coupling of biologic evolution with climate history as a result of the long-term carbon cycle is the critical driver of determinism, of rough determinism. And, uh, I published with Tal Evoke a paper uh, back in 88 on the biotic enhancement of weathering and very briefly life uh, accelerates the weathering of the uh, silicate minerals in the crust which are, constitute the sink drawing out carbon dioxide of the atmosphere and burying it in the ocean as limestone. And it uh, accelerates it at a lower temperature and CO2 level, get, uh, generating the same flux as before that would occur in an abiotic Earth. Uh, and here is my take on the temperature history of the biosphere. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this uh, interpretation is still under debate. There are, they are, the, there are the uniformitarianists in terms of climate history, which, which argue that back in the Archean, uh, roughly three billion years ago, the temperatures were pretty similar to today. On the other hand, I support a hot Archean climate, and this is reflected in the slide. And uh, we, the Earth's biosphere involves from an a hothouse to an ice house. We are close to the uh, uh, capacity to have another ice age uh, disregarding anthropogenic climate change. 
Uh, and this uh, uh, trajectory of biospheric evolution uh, actually results in an explosion of biologic diversity because you still have the old hot uh, habitats like thermophilic uh, hot springs, uh, but you combine it with uh, colder conditions, low CO2 and so on. So we have an explosion of biodiversity and a progressive increase in the biotic enhancement of weathering, as well as biotic productivity on land. Uh, this is the abstract. I'm not going to read it. Uh, we, all, we will get the abstracts online, so I'm going to skip over that. So a critical test for the difficulty in uh, major evolutionary emergences, I would argue, is that if a potential constraint is released at the time of emergence, then it was virtually inevitable. And uh, I would argue the upper temperature limits of the growth of the main groups of life correspond to the climatic temperatures at the time of emergence. This is the critical test, which is still, of course, subject to uh, research. And we, this is a table showing the upper temperature limits of growth, uh, starting the bottom with the prokaryotes, uh, the hyperthermophiles, and phototrophs, for example, cyanobacteria, um, uh, chloroflexus have an upper temperature limit of growth of about 70 degrees centigrade. And then eukaryotes, uh, that is cells with nuclei and mitochondria, 60 degrees centigrade. And then we go down to uh, the so-called higher kingdoms and the temperature gets lower. And this, the uh, the slide that I showed the temperature history uh, has uh, indicators on the approximate time of emergence. Now, I would argue that the upper temperature limits are actually likely primitive characters, primitive characters, because we've had roughly three, bi three billion years for phototrophs, photosynthesizers, to have been present on the planet. Uh, cyanobacteria emerged roughly about 2.8 billion years ago, and uh, they have not adapted to hyperthermophilic conditions, which is the ability to live and grow above 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, similarly, eukaryotes, probably at least 2 billion to 2.5 billion, and uh, there was a recent uh, Re, uh, paper reported in Nature of uh, fungi uh, dating back 2. Point, I believe 2.4 billion years old. Uh, so they've had a considerable time to adapt to higher temperatures, but have not succeeded because of the intrinsic biochemistry of their cell type. Uh, and here is briefly a summary of the case for a much warmer cl a climate on the early Earth than now. Uh, fundamentally, it's the oxygen isotopic record of sedimentary cherts, which are sil uh, silica precipitated in seawater, and a compelling case that the isotopic composition of oxygen has remained constant even going back in the Hadean, which is more about 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, the melting temperatures of proteins resurrected from sequences from molecular phylogenies also give paleo temperatures consistent with a very hot early climate. Uh, and uh, I won't read the rest, but uh, I'll just point to number five. <clears throat> uh, there was actually a very interesting study which inferred the viscosity of seawater at 2.7 billion years from the absence 
of ripple marks in uh, deep sea turbidites, deep sea sediments, and they inferred a, uh, a, a hot conditions roughly around 60 degrees centigrade. So this evidence uh, points to an important conclusion. The critical role of temperature constraint holding back the emergences of major groups, organ uh, biological groups, starting with photosynthesizers, culminating with metazoans, that is us, uh, animal life, in the late uh, Precambrian. Uh, here is a tree, actually, that I, uh, we published with Charlie Lineweaver back in 2004, uh, and it's, this is a molecular uh, phylogenetic tree uh, based on ribosomal RNA, but there have been more recent trees that most of which are consistent with this pattern, and the red here is uh, near the root of life, is corresponds to the highest temperature. So it gets progressively uh, cooler as you go out to more recent emergences. Uh, and if the Archean temperatures were similar to more recent to colder conditions, then we would see lower temperature prokaryotes near the root. And we don't see that, at least in most trees. And this is the paper with Bill Shope from uh, uh, PNAS, uh, which uh, inferred the paleo temperatures from uh, resurrected proteins of cyanobacteria. And again, it's consistent with emergence at 60 degrees at 2.8 billion years ago. And now there's a lot more studies which give a similar conclusion. Uh, now, here we have the, uh, a, a figure showing going from the past, which is to the right, to the future, to the left. And of course, the biosphere will be uh, uh, killed off in the future because the sun's luminosity continues to increase. Uh, I tell people that I'm a supporter of nuclear energy for humanity. Uh, it's at a safe distance 93 million miles away. It's the fusion reactor of the sun. And because of the increased density with the accumulation of helium, the temperature goes up, uh, the solar luminosity gradually increases from the past to, to the future. And uh, so you'll see that the temperature goes up uh, and exceeds the even hypothermophiles in a few billion years. Now, this we also see that this is a window of opportunity. The well near the present is where the temperatures were uh, not above that of vertebrates. And so we have a window which we, we argued was maximum encephalization. Maximum civilization. Our temperatures are body temperatures 38 degrees centigrade and normal if we don't have a high fever. And so we're near the limit. And this, of course, is related to the uh, need of the brain to be uh, energy intensive. I think an adult brain consumes uh, roughly 30% of the energy or maybe a little less. And uh, so we argued in several papers that uh, the, our uh, lineage hominids emerged uh, with the constraint of uh, this temperatures not being too high so the brain could lose heat efficiently. Uh, and so if we look at the Pleistocene uh, glacial interglacial cycle, we predict that the speciation roughly corresponded to when the Earth had ice ages. We're not arguing that Homo sapiens began in uh, Europe. <laughs> We're arguing that 
the cooler conditions globally uh, during a glacial period would allow a would allow uh, the emergence of a bigger brain, which is energy intensive, and it was the prime constraint for uh, encephalization for the steps. And uh, we also uh, see some correspondence to other animals. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the whales this, uh, and dolphins and so on during cooler periods. Okay, so what, we, uh, what I've argued here is that the pattern of biospheric evolution that, we, the, uh, that I presented raises the potential of similar coevolutionary relationships of life and its environment on Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. And then if you widen the uh, context, we would still get uh, roughly, roughly deterministic outcomes. So here are some of my papers and books and so forth. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I left some time for questions. Did everyone hear the question? A life has a regulatory capacity. Well, this actually, uh, in a few weeks, I'll be going to University of Exeter for the celebrating James Lovelock's 100th birthday. And uh, I suppose he's going to be there, too. And so <laughs> the, he was the father with Lynn Margulis, the uh, great biologist, of the Gaia hypothesis that life interacts in a intimate way with the environment. The original hypothesis is that it optimizes conditions for its existence. We, I do not argue that, neither did my collaborator Talabok. We argue that it's a major player, not that it determines op or optimizes. So it was a player in terms of a cooling history but in the context of the rising luminosity of the sun, which would tend to increase the surface temperature, the uh, history of the Earth outgassing, which is correlated roughly to the decay of radioactive elements in the Earth, and that would tend to reduce the outgassing of carbon dioxide. That would also, uh, by itself, lead to cooling. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, and also the growth of the continents over geologic time, cooling. So you have one factor, and I used to tell my students before I retired, uh, you got three factors lead to cooling, and one lead to warmer conditions. So three against one, doesn't that tell you the story? No, because you have to model the, each of its uh, impacts, which we did. But uh, yes, a life is a major player in that history, but it doesn't determine everything by itself. And you said the continents Yeah, uh, continents have increased uh, since the early Precambrian. Uh, they have, continents have grown. Uh, and so that would give more surface area to weather the rocks, which draws down carbon dioxide. The long-term biogeochemical cycle of carbon. <laughs>